Uh, we're going to go over some uh, meeting minutes. So the first one, the first one will be uh, regular meeting minutes for September 22nd, or no, I'm sorry, September 1st, thank you. September 1st, 2021. <laughs> Let me know. Ready? Uh, I move that we approve the minutes of the minutes of the minutes of the minutes is September eighth. Oh, I saw it. I saw it. I September 22nd. Second. All in favor? Second. Sorry. Madison, second. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Last one is for uh, the uh, public hearing case 2021C for September 29th. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Second page, the uh, where Mr. Matthews discussed that paragraph. Yep. Uh, Attorney Pellegrino stated he signed as the properly noticed. I'm not sure. Is that what it was? Noticed. Uh, manager of it should be LLC. The other one I had was uh, there's a zero light off property. Um, with not one degree of light surrounding. Yep. Um, that is exactly what you said. So it's not Z E R O. Oh, it could be Z E R O. Okay. Don't know. I will put that. Okay. And then parentheses and then Move the on. number. <laughs> Yes. Those um, well, I just remembered I had a meeting tomorrow morning. The motion at nine. The meeting minutes of the public hearing on page 21 C, which is in Summer Road, 2021, with the other changes that Chairman has to do. All right. Um, that close our regular meeting and I'm going to open up the public hearing and I'm going to read again the mask update. The updated CDC guidance continues to state that individuals who are fully vaccinated may, as a general matter, resume many of the activities that they were engaged in prior to the pandemic without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart except where otherwise regulated by federal, state, or local laws, rules, or regulations. In response to the recent spread of the Delta variant, however, the CDC's updated guidance does recommend that even fully vaccinated persons wear masks or face coverings when indoors if other risk factors are present. In light of the information provided by the CDC and in order to maximize protection of, the, of vulnerable individuals from the Delta variant, the Department of Public Health now advises that a fully vaccinated person should wear a mask or face covering when indoors and not in your own home if you have a weakened immune system or if you are at increased risk for severe disease because of your age or an underlying medical condition or if someone in your household has a weakened immune system is at increased risk for severe disease or is unvaccinated. That's out of the way. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the applicant. You've given us some, I said, one revised set here of the plans. That's some. I just want to take one. I just want to follow up on the request from the board, tell you what the amended plans we've submitted, and just walk you through a few things. So the first, uh, and what you have in front of you is uh, L, uh, L41. This is just so everybody else can see it. If you could take a look at that. Um, we talked last time about the two uh, residential abutters. They're uh, depicted on the bottom part of the diagram. So it's 187 feet just to where the 50 foot setback would be to give you some idea of how big that is. Um, the last house over here in the middle, if you see this one, the closest to uh, Richard Green uh, Real Estate uh, Insurance, which is right here, is 33 feet to the veterinarian fence, 33 feet, and the fence is on the boundary line. Um, so it's not set back. There's no setback whatsoever. On the right, where the uh, Richard Green Insurance Agency is, there's only half a fence, uh, and the other, the other part is uh, unobstructed view to this house. 
with um, uh, spotlight, and I just went by it again tonight to check, that faces out directly at the neighbor. It's not, there's no dark lighting on any of these properties. Directly across the street, and it's right here, and I didn't get it up because just because of the way it views is where the gas station is, which is neon lit. And if you look at the proximity to the houses, to the neon gas station, to the where this site is, we're talking 180, think of how big that is, it's two thirds of a football field. Before we get to a six foot, or if you want an eight foot height fence, which I'm gonna again make another parlay tonight, cause I think it's a mistake putting eight foot feet in, but if that's what the board wants, we're happy to comply. Um, but you're before you get there. And also the reason why I did this is so you can see the type of trees that are in between. So this is, you know, as far as distance, it, it's, it's twice, three times, well, actually five times what that distance is, more than five times, six times which is uh, dramatic. So that's, I thought that's very important uh, in light of some of the discussion that we've gone through. The second one I'd like to point out is, um, this is 4-2, which is the next one you have diagram you have in front of you. And the reason why I put this down is you may recall, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk through this, this is our fourth meeting, so I won't bore you with it about the character of the neighborhood and things of that nature. Um, I tried to articulate it in, uh, in one of the prior meetings, but I thought visual, you can see it. Um, this is immediately abutting. You see, this is where the septic company is with all the trucks out there in the yard, all openly visible to the street. The uh, trash trucks, like we talked about before over here. Uh, and then we talked about the neon lit over here and the uh, uh, lack of um, uh, fencing or other uh, barriers. So that gives you a, a good sense of it. But what's more uh, shocking, I think, to the eye is when you take a look at how small our project is, in relation to the open space back here, the open space here, uh, and you have the two businesses there. This is, this, it couldn't fit in a better envelope than this property with the house and the fence along the front. So um, I thought that, you know, rather than me trying to explain it to you, you can see it firsthand. Uh, the plans that we've submitted tonight, that you have a copy for, uh, copy in front of you, and um, I apologize. I, I thought I was going to have the small ones for y'all to look at, but if you have a look at the big plan, I'll walk you through it. Um, and it also it includes the eight foot high fence that the board requested. Um, it runs along the. Uh, you know what? I have another set I can put on this side. If you all can just share that on this side. Yeah. And I'm just going to highlight the, the different things I'll talk about in the plan, and then obviously you'll look at it, I'm sure, in, in more detail. So the board had requested that we include an eight-foot high fence, vinyl, uh, as opposed to chain link. Um, then we include that around the perimeter. Uh, the board requested that we put the 50 feet uh, setback on the buffer area along the two residential properties, which we did that. Uh, the board requested that we have ample spacing in, uh, spacing in the RV so We've done that around the entire property. Um, and I was just going to point, uh, point out a couple small things uh, about the RV in a minute. Uh, we did remove the dumpster as requested by the board. Uh, we've previously provided the height of the facilities, which the board requested. So um, uh, that's a previously given. I've handed out to you tonight uh, l and plan updating it with the two additional requests that there be spring and fall cleanup of the RV uh, per, I think it was Ms. Beatty. Um, and the other one was the mowing plan included in the o &M, so that's been updated, and that was one of the handouts I gave you. With regards to the plan you have in front of you, um, I'm just going to flip through it. So the first one is L1, and you'll see over there that uh, this is depicting the, the area where the dumpster is, is just shaded in, and, to, and that will be uh, impervious, not uh, uh, porous concrete there, so we'll just like the rest of the parking area. So it's just expanded for that one little space on that plan. Um, with regards to the first one, if you look down at the bottom, this is the L1. You'll see the 50 foot setback with the bushes in front of the vinyl um, fence going there undisturbed. And that reflects the undisturbed nature of it <clears throat> um, as far as uh, grading that was requested by a board member. And lastly, um, you'll see the Arvivati running along the uh, fence. Um, there is a, a, a gap uh, because if you put them too close with vinyl, they'll die. So it requires them to be further out. So I just <clears throat> um, uh, want to be clear about that. 
if you go to the next page, <clears throat> um, this is uh, L2. On L2, it's actually we don't have to we don't have to bother with L2 and L3 because these are essentially just all we did was clean them up. So we took out all the electrical um, uh, conduits and, and connections for the solar since it's no longer part of it. We thought it'd be easier and cleaner for you to read. So we removed it. If you go to uh, L4, um, this is again outlines uh, the same thing. It shows you the clarity up on the top of um, where the dumpster was removed. It shows you where the it's on L5, actually L5 is a better representation. It shows you where the septic is. It was a request not to have the septic on land that we don't own. So I want to talk about that for a minute, but if you look at L5 for a moment, you'll see it. It's it's on the um, on the uh, front area on the side closest to the road from the fence, but it's still set back way back onto the property. So it's not up close. You see the two rectangular boxes there, they're dotted lines. You able to find it? Yeah. yeah. Now, um, I just want to talk a minute about, and I know one board member had a request about not having it on land you don't own. <clears throat> uh, in Massachusetts, an easement is an ownership in, in land, and it and it suffices for, for a road frontage for zoning purposes. It suffices um, for uh, all sorts of different development requirements in, in every city and town. So I would suggest that an easement would if we left it where it is, makes more sense um, than putting it out here. But if the board wants it, we can put it out here. What happened, and this is worth just a two minute uh, explanation, you'll understand, and I'm gonna dovetail into another topic while I'm telling you it. And so this, as you all know, was owned by a farm. Essentially, they um, uh, own a big parcel of land, they subdivided. And when they subdivided it, they redrew the lines again a second time. So they accidentally put the boundary of land on uh, 16 Summers Road side with a septic on the other. So it was a, as a essentially just a, a surveyor running the line on the wrong side. So the bottom line of it is, is there's an ad, clear adverse possession claim um, to the easement area. It's been uh, uh, used for a period of time that suffices. So there's an ownership right as a, as a matter of law to perfect that right. Uh, we would have to go to court and that could take some time. The alternative and normally how they'll settle is you, instead of pursuing an adverse possession because the other side doesn't want to incur the time and expense, you do an easement and you pay money for an easement and it, it, it's a small, it, it, it's better than redrafting with surveys. So I just asked the board reconsider an easement um, leaving it in place because I think it's better for all involved. Um, but if not, per your request, we put it on the plan, an alternative site. So if you were to vote, I would ask you to vote that it even be in one of the two locations. So we wrap up the easement afterwards and we have a legal right to it. We keep it where it is. If we can't, then we have to incur the expense and build it on site. Um, so I just want to walk through. And that complies just to make it simple with all of the setback requirements, the 100 feet, the 50 feet, uh, five yards off the boundary line. Uh, and the, all the measurements are on there on the plan. <clears throat> okay. Uh, there were just a couple other um, quick ones I want to talk about, which have to do more with... Uh, some uh, concerns raised at the last meeting about uh, storage of hazardous material or, or things of that nature. Uh, I did uh, check further. We, I have the ins our insurance clause, which I'm happy to provide if everybody wants to read a, uh, uh, have a copy of it, you can look at it. Uh, the simple reality is uh, there's an overriding uh, uh, binder you can put on, it's $7,500 a year, and it covers uh, uh, up to a million dollars, all anything that migrates off. But, but what's more important is, well, I recognize there's a slim, almost non-existent potential for that happening for two reasons. Number one, we're on, they're on video camera. We have the right to enter the store, the units 24 seven at our, our pleasure. Um, so I think just through simple diligence, it probably won't happen, but let's assume it happens. Um, we get to the next uh, component, which is, which is really interesting because there was uh, two concerns. One that it would migrate off site and the other concern was that, um, yeah, the other one was that um, uh, that it would leach through the porous uh, blacktop. Um, that is both are both um, 
Yes, it could hypothetically leach off. And I, you may recall, and I got a kind of a technical explanation of um, why it wouldn't. But with porous, this is specifically designed for this. So it's harder for it to migrate off the porous uh, asphalt than it is off a of non porous. And the reason being, and I'm going to show you in a second, I think this, because I have to break it down for myself because I'm not a scientist. When I'm understanding this. So I thought the best to share with you what I'm looking at so you understand why this scientifically makes sense and why our landscape architect proposed this in conformance with the same uh, system that was used in Provincetown. So you have in front of you a porous, porous asphalt paving. And it, importantly, over on the chart to the right is what's, what's interesting is that because there's such depth here in the bottom part, more than seven, uh, seven feet to seasonal high groundwater. So after you get through all of these layers, there's another seven feet. <clears throat> what happens is when it goes through the porous, it's designed to let water pour through. Oils are heavier than water. They don't, they don't readily... Uh, go through a porous pavement. And if they did, there's another layer, and I gave it to you, the choker course, which it has to migrate through. And then below that, you have the, un, and I'm, I'm going to stress this, uncompactable fill, which makes it more difficult. So in other words, first, it would have to penetrate the porous, which is not designed to, and all the literature that we provided supports that, and Ty and Bond confirmed that. Second, um, even if it were hypothetically to make it through there, it has to go through this next uh, choker level, which is designed as essentially a filtration base. Then it has to go through the uncompacted fill and it would have to somehow migrate, uh, which is a very slow migration. So what you actually have is, is a better system than if it were straight imperious, imperious, excuse me, um, and, and it, it would puddle up on top. Uh, so for all of those reasons, and the reason why I'm, I'm giving you this in conjunction with the Insurance is something that we talk to with the insurance company and they, the underwriters look at these documents and they see them. The policy is, can go on this, uh, on this site. It would protect again any, potentially if it migrated off site, any third party claim against for anything that originates from this site. So there's, you know, and that's something that will be in place. You know, obviously we need it for uh, our financing. Uh, the neighbors, you, you uh, I guess, want it for your protection for the, the neighbors. We don't have a problem with that. So if that were a condition, I just wanted to be really clear about that because I think that, you know, it, we can talk about possible scenarios. You know, everything in life is possible. But the reality of something happening is, is especially in this scenario, slim to none. And if it were to happen, then you have this, this insurance, which would provide the cleanup both on-site and off-site and cover anybody who's harmed. Um, so I wanted to address that. I believe those are the all of the points that the board asked us to address. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just wanted to make sure that we met all of your requests. Um, I don't have anything further. I, I just had a quick question. You said that the residue um, that is not water. Mm -hmm would puddle on a on no that would this is a porous site porous site right. it it it, it would go? it would not go through quicker but it would stay on top it would still migrate slowly but the, the catch the catch here is it can't if it's on a imperious imperious it would flow right off it would here impervious here it would it would flow off now uh what happens is it, it sits there if there were a spill, mm -hmm. if any of it leaks through, it wouldn't migrate because it has to get through those courses. So what you would do is you excavate up you, you, the, the concrete there, you take this portion out, any contaminants, and you remove it. As opposed to if you did it on impervious, it would flow and go off the of site. Right. And here, it can't get off site because it migrates down. And then once it gets there, it gets trapped in the choker level. And it, and it, it could move, but you're talking years for, for- But it would require you to identify that it's there. Absolutely. It's going to- it is going to migrate mm -hmm. to, uh, through the very top layer mm -hmm. enough so that I might not recognize that it's there. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to know that it's there and, and that chunk needs to be taken out? And because you do the you, each in our own end plan. Remember, we do our uh, vacuum of it. We go through the whole thing. So it's an inspection. You're doing that uh, annually and, and more frequently because you're on site. So you have cameras. You see if anybody spills. You're going to you would see it. It can't it can't go through that quickly. So in other words, if you had a large volume, sure it would puddle. 
Absolutely. And would it move across the top? Yeah. But I mean, you'd, you'd need large volumes of it and you'd have to drop it right at the corner of the parking lot, which is not feasible because none of the doors <clears> open <throat> there. So it, that's why I'm saying it would stop. It would start in the middle for it to migrate off over the top is almost impossible. It would have to come through and then migrate down, which takes forever. So you would know if a substance is on there because you'd see like you would with anything, you know, some, some discoloration, some, uh, when I, I don't want to use the word puddling because I think it's misleading, but um, some substance on the top because it just can't migrate through that quick. A glistening, maybe. Good word. <laughs> Good word. And, and who's doing this um, cleaning of the asphalt? Well, there's a companies that come in. It's part of our plan, our own end. We have mm -hmm. to have it annually. And they come in and do the vacuum because you, what you want to do is vacuum up any um, uh, sand or sediment or things of that nature, right? Um, and the person who's doing it is educated enough to be looking for a spill. A oh, they, these are companies that are trained. This is this is what they specifically come in and do. That's all right. Um, forgive me if I've missed it, but is there like a plan for how frequently you'll be mowing the raster? In, in our own M, it's on the on the last page. We put uh, seasonally as needed. I mean, okay. I didn't know that you wanted to be more specific. It's a requirement, yeah. Um, and in the event that you have a pest problem, mm -hmm. what would be your plan? Um, well, we would obviously we could spray for it. We could do. I mean, now it's pretty inexpensive to do the whole property. You know, and there's companies that do it during the uh, during the season. So if that were a problem, we'd certainly address that. Okay. Uh, only thing I noticed is on L1 uh, still shows storage units with roof mounted solar panels. Yeah, he just that's just he just didn't clean it up, but we can strike that from it. There it is. He was trying to clear up all of the, uh, you know, it's like a lot of people are very busy. But when you ask him to get a few last week, you get it, you know, and yep. he's just trying to clean that up. So, well, just I just wanted to ask because it was shown as typical. So, we got the on L1, yeah, L1 shine still. Uh, just on the top, top row of the units. Yeah. Okay. Se seasonally, will you be using fertilizer? Uh, see, uh, I mean, we don't have that big of a lawn space, so I don't think it's going to be a big issue. Um, I mean, I, honest with you, uh, that's not something we even consider fertilizer at this point. Generally, we put a <coughs> sprinkler there and get grass, and it's not a big problem. Yeah. But, one would. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the other point I was going to make too. Um, you know, in the site, remember, not only this site, but all of the site, the bigger site was used as a farm. So they're tilling out there with tractors, with oil into the dirt uh, for, you know, <clears throat> at least 40 years prior, prior to our use here. So it gives you, you know, if anything, this is, this is more protective to the environment than what, what had occurred, including pesticides, um, and all the different uh, organic or inorganic substances that were kept on site. Um, I have one request, okay, um, that these plans, the revised set of plans, okay, mm -hmm. send them from Berkshire Design, send them up with their um, with their calculations mm -hmm. for the stormwater, okay? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make you aware there's a new stormwater bylaw, and when I say new, it was, um, it's out now, okay? Mm -hmm. It's posted now. So it was approved at town meeting in May, Mm -hmm. um, I made the error. I thought everybody was working to it. And I'm sorry um, because I thought that once it was approved at town meeting, <clears throat> it's a general bylaw, so it has to wait for attorney general and then the posting by a constable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I made that error. I thought everybody was working to the latest, so they may not be working to the latest. So I'm going to ask that you send these plans up to. Um, time bond mm -hmm. and have them reviewed again to the latest stormwater bylaw. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And then 
then you can probably go forward because um, you're going to need stormwater permitting and everything else. Yeah, we, we checked when we filed the solar clear. We were told we did not need to file it until after um, uh, until after we were approved. We're mindful of this new change and and some of the concerns, so we have no problem doing that. I appreciate. We'll submit the permit. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm going to open it up. The meeting I have to leave by um, 745. Okay, so I'll open it up um, for questions from the um, from the audience. Here. And just say your name. Mary Grissetti, Meadowbrook Top, 50 Meadowbrook Lane. Thank you. So we're we're not going to spend a lot of time going over um, everything that we've gone over for the last I don't know six to seven meetings, but we want to reiterate for you the areas, uh, the three main uh, concerns that we have about these projects, both of these projects. Um, the first one is the rural character of the town. And um, there has been uh, at several meetings talk about this particular area of town. It's where I live. So I live there on Meadowbrook Lane. And um, the, 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 the thinking seems to go is, well, there's a, 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 a trash place there. There's a gas station there. There is um, Billy Bond's septic place there. So, hey, the place is already a dump, let's now throw in 800 storage sheds. Well, I take offense to that. The area is a beautiful area. There is eight acres of trees and flowers and animals. I don't know if anyone has thought about what may be living in there. So um, I want you to think about the rural character of this town. This is, this is what I live by. And I live by Rick Green's place with the bagel nook and Rick Green's insurance. I live by my street right here, which has homes probably that were built in the 50s, very modest homes with modest income people living in this area. Um, I also live near um, Munson, Munson Savings Bank. And so a question that I have is, why isn't there an eight foot fence outside of Munson Savings Bank? I, I'm just wondering, why is there not an eight foot fence? There is money in that bank. I would think we would want a big fence around that, but I don't see a fence around Munson Savings Bank. Um, Rich Redeker right here is quite a large building, but it's a beautiful building. And not only that, they employ 80 people. My daughter worked there out of college and made an excellent salary that got her started. These, these places, one person, one person you're going to employ. And I don't, actually, I don't even know if this facility is going to employ a person because I do think it might be remote going in and out. Um, we have, uh, where's my church? Church is on there somewhere. Um, and Steeple View was named after that because you look down and you see the steeple of the church. You look down now, and this is what you're going to see. And, and the um, solar panels are gone, but you're gonna look down from steeple view and you're gonna see storage view. That is impacting the rural character of the town. So this is, and this is the rectory um, that has been here for years and years. So this is a beautiful area of town. 800 storage sheds does not belong in the crossroads of our town. We're not against storage sheds at all. If there was an appropriate place for them, we have one set in town. And I don't know that any member of this community came to these meetings and opposed that storage shed. So there are reasons why we're here. Um, impact of the property values. And I have spoken about this at other meetings. Uh, I lived here for 39 years. I have a home. I'm looking to uh, secure the property values of my home. That's a big part of my retirement. So for something like this to come in here, no person in this room 
can tell me that that's not going to bring down the property values. And if you look up Crab Creek, North Carolina, that was one of their biggest um, reasons why the planning board unanimously said no, because they, they, had, uh, they, they were able to spend the money and have somebody come in and show the property values will go down. We have spoken to realtor after realtor in this area. They said unequivocally, your property values will go down, but we can't get a realtor to go on record because they're still working in the business. So our property values. So my retirement is going to be taken down for a project like this. So property values. And our last one is the um, quality of our drinking water. I have a well water. I have neighbors who have 16 foot well waters. And excuse me. So if you look at Inside Cell Storage, which we have been in that site quite a bit, it is a premier site for people who own and are thinking about developing self-storage facilities. And in their own literature, they talk about the dangers of hazardous materials inside of storage sheds. And one of the things they said is, yes, meth labs happen inside of storage sheds. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does. And if you look in the news and you Google it, you will find meth labs operating inside self-storage sheds. That is unbelievably dangerous for the environment. But self-storage also says, but it's not just the med lab, lab, meth labs. Yes, that's rare. It's the everyday things that people put into the storage sheds that impact the aquifer and the water. So will a meth lab go in? Hopefully not. But will some person thinking that it's okay to store these chemicals inside of the storage shed go in? Absolutely, yes. That happens all the time. And that doesn't come from me. That comes from inside self-storage. And they have talked about the dangers of these places. Now, again, I'm going back to self-storage. People need it. Not here on top of our aquifer. Um, and for the record, I just want to present to you again, and I know you all have a copy of this, but I want it on record tonight that we're also using the excellent report that Mr. Coyne put together looking at um, the water and contaminants. Um, so I would like that to go on the record. So I don't have to give it to you. Make sure okay. And the other thing on the record again this evening, I would like the um, letter that we gave you last week where we cited eight bylaws that both of these projects violate. So um, do I need to give you that or I'll, I'll give it to you again. Um, so thank you. Wait a minute, this gentleman over here. Can you state your name, please? Peter Simmons. I spoke last week on the insurance. Um, I can almost guarantee that the policy that Mr. Pellegrino um, was talking about is a claims made policy. <laughs> what that means is that the claim has to be made within the period of time that the policy is. You can get a policy that's in effect for the next year that expires and a claim is made afterwards, it's not going to be covered under that policy. Now, presumably, he's going to get another policy after that. But as he pointed out, he's very he's correct about that, about this. These problems take place over a period of many years. Who knows who's going to be there 20 years from now? I do this for a living. These things happen over decades. If people spill things, they may clean them up, they go, they'll seep through the cracks in the uh, 
So then people won't know that. And, and then all of a sudden, 30 years later, you'll find out that people's wealth are contaminated. And you'll say, oh, okay, we'll just call them if they have insurance, but they're gone. Or they don't have the insurance anymore. Or whoever is occupying that space doesn't have that insurance. There's no guarantee whoever takes that space, that, that space over, either as an owner of the property or operates a business there, is going to carry the same type of insurance. So, um, and, and a million dollars is not a lot of insurance. These, uh, these contamination spills take millions, tens of millions. I've seen hundreds of millions. I'm not saying you get a hundred million dollar plus spill here, but it's, it's going to take, if you had a, a spill that takes place over a period of many years, chances are it's going to take a lot more than a million dollars to clean up. Thank you. <laughs> Stop the clapping, please. I'm Jacqueline Fournier. I live at 199 Chapin Road. I'm having some difficulty. I'm on a raised, I'm on the side of a little mountain. My water's starting to taste funky. So I called the town hall and said, help. I talked to the Board of Health. You're on your own, lady. Very nicely. So I had to truck off someplace and then I got back with the report. There's a lot, a double the amount of sodium in my water on the hill. And so when I say to the, uh, the people in the town hall, they sent me to someone else and they said, it's not such a big deal. People have more salt than that. Now I'm a nurse, everyone's salt conscious. If my salt in my well is double what it is now on the hill, and the other thing that has been interesting, I've only lived here 15 years and I'm a nurse. And whenever I go any place, I'm doing this, I'm looking. When I come into Hamden or leave Hamden, there is more wetland in Hamden than any other place I've ever been, okay? So when you're coming in from the East Long Meadow, I'm coming in from the East Long Meadow. I don't want to call it a swamp, okay? On the right, there's a wetland. On the left, there's a wetland. If you go up and put it on some road, there's a river. There are too many wetlands and with aquifers and however many levels, I have to now contact a well digger and have him come out and tell me if it's a danger. No one could tell me that double the amount is a danger. I, I know I don't want any salt at all. Secondly, and, and this is a question that amazes me, I came to Hamden and felt this was the purest form of government I've ever seen. And I've come to some of these meetings and, and I want to say to you, what is the storage unit doing for us in Hamden? What is it about us? Do we need storage? You know, if I had my brothers, I'd rather put a, a medical center. You know, if I was in charge, I'm an old lady who's been around the tree a lot. But I don't know what a storage unit does for Hamden, aside from the possibility of problems. If you told me that it was going to be something worthwhile to the people of Hamden, mm -hmm. makes me wonder, how did you choose Hamden? Because of the swamp land? Because the property was cheap? Because you think we're less than smart and you could sneak it in? I don't understand what's going here, obviously. There have been probably 10 meetings. I come home, the signs and the dates are changing. Obviously, they don't have a permit yet. They've not, this is not even signed and sealed. But what, what are you doing for Hamden? Are you going to give us a lot of tax money? Are you going to give everybody a free storage unit? No, I don't want it. I live on seven acres. Okay. Something's not right. And today in the newspaper, when I came home, there's something that you guys want to do with the sewer lines and the water lines, and it stinks of the Black Horse thing when they were trying to tell us that we needed to put in sores and this. We voted that down, you know? We've got our own small peaceful thing. If you told me what good storage unit, and I go crazy with, we have four or five what are those farms with electricity? So my question is, what does it pay me and the town? It doesn't pay us anything. They pay so much to the town. So what does the town do with the money? It goes into the general fund. 
Well, I'll be damned if the general fund doesn't help with the taxpayer, doesn't help, everything's going up. So what, why are you coming to Hamden? Why? The end. <laughs> We stuck with clap. I am Jane Villadella. I live on Spring Meadow Lane. And where I live, we are not permitted to do any maintenance on our cars or wash our cars because of the runoff because of our well, which is connected to the aquifer where the storage units are doing. Second of all, if you remember a few years ago, the Westover moved their stuff to Barnes out in Westfield, and they were doing some kind of fire drills and using fire. Oh, guess what? Southampton wells were violated by that plan. They had to close them all down, and some of those were farms where they used that water for their animals and plants. A third thing. In, in Westfield, a couple of dentists got together after Riverside closed up. They wanted to put a racetrack out there and they voted it down because of the contaminants from the automobile racing. So I just want you to think about that. Our water is a very big supply volume. Out west in Arizona, they're putting in a lithium plant, so we can have batteries and chips. And the people are up in arms because you know what? It's sitting on top of a huge aquifer. And they're having a lot of drought out there. I mean, we have to think about the future, not today's whose pocketbook is going to get filled up. We have to really think about what is lying at us. And we have children that are growing up here. We don't want that water contaminated. We already have wells in Hamden that are contaminated and it stinks. We need to preserve ourselves. God isn't making any more land. We know that. Amen. Yes. Thank you. I'm Dorothy Cameron, the other thing. I'm surprised you all know. So, this gentleman who's talking about the insurance rates is a really good question. Uh, I know that you're requiring them to have some type of insurance to cover if there's an issue. But if for some reason or another, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, he sells. Do you have any say on what their insurance policy is going to be? So you can actually say, okay, if you sell, you're required to have this. Yeah, so if, if we required an uh, insurance policy, it would be tied to the special permit. So just like we get an operation and maintenance plan every year, an update so on operation. So it can be tied to the actual permit for this site. To the property instead of the owners. Exactly. The special permit is tied to the to the site, just so you know that it's not tied to the office. Okay, thank you. Good job. Hi, my name is Tara Harrison, and I live on Cascia Lane. Um, I watched last week's meeting, and I haven't been able to be here in person previously because I believe had conflict. Um, but many have attested to tonight, including what was um, talked about briefly yesterday. Is um I'm actually I lived in Palmer growing up. I moved to New Jersey. I lived there for 25 years. I had it up to here because of industrial and concrete land. And I moved back home and I moved to Hamden. And the, the one thing that shocked me is that regarding these storage units, I live right off of Summers Grove. Um, there's already a solar field that we know that's right across from um, the crossroad of Martin Farms to the Summers. And I can attest to the fact that it's actually disturbed my brook water on my land. Um, my brook runs dry now. It used to run all year round. So whatever they did on Summers with those panels affected my neighbor's yards as well. And we do live on protected wetlands as well. Um, I think about the frog population, especially with our peepers and everything. You know, that's one of our tiniest, who cares about the frog? But it's one of the most um, precious ecological resources that we have. And if this biological creature dies out, we're going to have a huge problem. 
and what cities in New Jersey are already facing because of these concrete buildings, they're finding an infestation of new insects that they've never seen before. And they're deforesting the, the land and they're everywhere. They're like gnats. People are finding them in their homes now. They've never seen these creatures before. They don't know where they came from. But this is a, a huge concern. We're turning our town into a concrete village. And I specifically came home because this is such precious wetlands. But this land, this, these are natural resources that can't be replenished. And I too worry about my land property. I know it's going to decrease if these things go in. The other issue that nobody thinks about is um, we used to call them lawnmower cars where we lived in New Jersey. You could hear them buzz all night long. And if these people have remote access or coming from everywhere into the storage facilities, they're going to wake up neighbors. They will wake us up. And not only than that, with all the construction noise, there's another solar farm being built off of Sophia and the Potash Lake. So all I hear is construction, construction, construction. There's going to be construction across from summers now, more traffic, and now we're going to have an increase of traffic down in the middle of town. That's from outsiders coming in. The, 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 the town can't sustain something. Thank you. Ted Brown, 45 Meadowbrook. I, I gave this out last week. I just want to get it in the record. And I would say, Unintended consequences. We talked a lot about that. Unintended consequences. So all these plans are good, but if something goes south, it's hard to fix. And if you look on these pictures that I pulled off the internet, you don't see very many, you don't see houses here. There's some, a few. But you, you don't plot these things 50, 100 feet from a bunch of houses. They, people just don't do it. So I, I would say that. I would say, uh, again, unintended consequences. And Peter's good points about insurance that, you know, it's going to take a lot of insurance to fix the problem. Big money, right? That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Jeff. Jeff Grissetti, 15 Meadowbrook Lane. Uh, I just wanted to speak to Peter's point about the insurance. And then again, how $1 million doesn't look like it's going to cut it at all. Uh, do you have a figure that you're going to hold these uh, people to? Or do, is there a value that you think you should have? When we hear from the insurance guy that says a million times, no? and we hear 750 or, or 7,500 a year, we'll get you a million. So maybe they should know how much insurance they're going to have to bring forward. Uh, is that in the plan for this? No, not it's, it's, it's not. It's not a requirement of the bylaw. Okay, so I can't tell you a number. It, will there be a requirement? So you can't tell me that. I can't tell you that. Yeah. Okay, that's not you. Not till we do it. Not your stuff. No, not till we. Not till okay, we make need to take a look at. It yes, and do some work. The board. The board would have to deliberate and vote on what the requirement of the special permits would be. And part of that could be the insurance requirement and amount and that sort of thing. All right. So that would have to come, you know, get voted on as a condition of the special permit if the special permit were to get approved. All right. I got a question for Mark Feeney. Can I go that way? Oh, no. 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 Okay. <laughs> got to go All right. So we'll go to him. <laughs> Mark Feeney. Uh, and it, it's tech, technical, it's engineering, and it's good, it's legitimate stuff. Uh, but in essence, what he, he said, because he took both projects, laid them out, and there's permeable asphalt and impermeable. His thoughts and his conclusion is that this permeable asphalt does not work. And it does not work because it gets in the ground fast. 
Uh, mean, what, what do you mean? Yes. Because it's open up like an open loop or like anything. Like so you're a saying. Strainer. So you're saying what gets in there? The the water? Oh the, well, no, water's good. There's water going in there oh, now. Everything's okay. fine. Okay. So this is hazardous material. I'm okay. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted yeah. to clarify. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and I wish you the best with your decisions. <laughs> Okay. This I has mean, a, this has Mark to either. talk to us. Yeah, well, yes, if 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 Mark would like to, okay. he <laughs> may. <laughs> he said, "I'm sorry." Mark, please real five better. Well, yeah, go ahead. Permeable pavement. It's in the bylaw. Treat grease and oil. It says all. <laughs> I already gave it to you on the other one. So I, it, it says all systems are to treat grease and oil. From your pavement doesn't do it. And you know it doesn't do it because Pine Bond will tell you that it doesn't do it. His review came that top from your pavement, top course, four inches thick. It's 20% voids, voids a hole. The choker course is 40% voids, meaning once it gets through the top, which is 20% holes, the sieve opens up. So now you're 40% holes and you make it through the choker course. The rest of it is filter system, which is P-stone, that doesn't keep anything out. And bottom line is, when you get to exactly what Berkshire Design is telling you he's using is University of New Hampshire Stormwater Center. At the bottom of it, it says, after you get through the pervious pavement, the choker course, the filter course, which is sub-base and P-stone, get through the P-stone and you get into the reservoir course, which is crushed stone. It says optional liner for land uses where infiltration is undesirable. Example, hazardous material handling, sole source aquifer protection. So they're telling you, if you don't want all the contaminants, which is grease and oil, going into the aquifer, hit it with a bladder. And now you just created a bathtub. Mm -hmm. It doesn't migrate anywhere. You don't want it to get down into the soil. And then everybody's yelling insurance. Insurance is only good for when bad things happen. You still got to fix it. So, how much money is it going to take to fix an aquifer? It doesn't get fixed. Because even though Jason says I have recoveries and I've worked on a lot of them, be honest with me, do you get it all out? What do you mean do you get it all out? The background? Yes, you have to in Massachusetts. Do, or but you do you do. get it all out? Yes. If I had a gas does it come out of the aquifer? Do you get it all out of the aquifer? And the answer is no, because I still have it sitting around. It's, it's transmitted all through one part. It started at Central High from the gas station on the corner, and it's running, and now it's all under one part. Reason being is because you can't capture it because it's floating on top of the water. Because it's lighter than water. It's likely because it's not a GW1 area in Massachusetts and they have different cleanup standards. Are they getting their water from Blunt Park? They're going to have a no, different cleanup standard. No, they're not. That's my so point. They have a different cleanup standard. But, but that's my point. They have a different cleanup standard. And in this case, we don't need a different cleanup standard. We don't want any gas, recent oil in the aquifer because they're drinking. So that's why it wasn't an issue to take it out because of the municipal water supply. So they're not drinking. 
but the gas, there's a 16th of an inch layer of gas floating on top of the water. And they haven't been able to get rid of it for 40 years because it keeps yes. floating up and down. That, but that's a different animal. Yeah. It's a different animal, but we, it's still an aquifer. I, I don't mean to sh shut you down. We got your point. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't comply with the zoning bylaw. All grease and oil. Okay. All. Thank you. All right. Yes. Um, so, Jason, we're talking about the aquifer and the cleaning of it. We're just, we're, we're, sorry, we're, yeah, how no, actually, with the cleaning of the aquifer, if there was we're, something that happened, how does that get? We're not going to, yeah. I, I don't want to get into I, We're going down a rabbit hole. Yeah, okay? we're going down we're a education hole. I just want to know. Listen, here's the bottom line is that, and I'm going to say it because each one gets treated differently, if I'm correct. Every every site. So for us to pontificate and to figure out how we would take care of this one, we're not going to get into that. Okay. You ask about how they clean up an aquifer. Who knows? And and Jason might have worked on a hundred of them, but you know what? That hundred and first one might be different. Okay. They are all different. There's a bunch of technologies, and a lot of times when they don't clean up to background, background being natural concentrations in the area, it's because the regulations don't require them to. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> okay. But there's a, there's a number of different ways that yes, they would do it. Right. So for us to figure out how what's going to happen in the future, nobody here has a crystal ball. Nobody has a crystal ball. No one knows what's going to happen in the future, okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody here can tell you that your well will be perfect for the rest of your life. So... And, and you don't have a crystal ball, but you are the planning board. We are so the planning board. So you do have a responsibility to look into the future for this town. Yeah. Um, so I hope that you do look at that and think about these issues about the water. And, and you're saying that you, you don't know how it's going to get cleaned up. If we, it happens. We can't tell you. We're not no, here. But, but think We're, about yeah. how to avoid something like that. So you don't have to ever be in the position of thinking, oh wow, what are we going to be ruined in the aquifer? Um, I'll offer the last comment. Just a couple of quick points. Um, first, I just want to be clear, and I don't think it was intentional, uh, Ms. Grissetti's comments. Uh, this is not an 800 storage uh, uh, facility, it's 283. So I just want to be clarified for what this board is looking at with respect to here. Um, the second one is we've heard a lot of talk about the possibility that someone's going to have some contaminant. Um, the surrounding area on the aquifer are residents. People do uh, mechanic, they fix their car in the driveway. They can easily store substance in their home or in their yard, which is much, which would migrate much quicker. The important point here is the, the foundation, the storage facilities are concrete. So if it's placed in the inside the facility, it's got to first get through a concrete foundation, then get into the forest, then go through the whole uh, chain of Lake Avey. So the likelihood of it happening is, I still suggest slim to none. Uh, with regard to the uh, type of policy, um, I think the board is correct. The, the policy is a requirement of the, uh, of the special permit. That's what the board determines. Uh, the difference here is you're far more protected because if someone does it in their home and they spill it and they, and they sell the home, there's no requirement they have a policy of this nature. And, and that's much more likely to occur than a regulated site, which has cameras. Um, people are know they're on camera 24 seven, it's inspected daily. Um, and we have all the, all the different barriers we talked about. Yeah, uh, in regards to Ms. Fournier's comment, um, and, I, and I'm sure she wasn't able to attend the meeting when we started, but just to recap here, uh, you know, I don't know what happened with Great Horse, nor do I think it's relevant, but uh, the simple reality of it is, is you can't do a medical center there because the world, the, the town doesn't want to put the, the water system in place. So you need a low, low impact use. This is a low impact use, which works for the community again, as much as it does for uh, the developer on that side. So that's why we couldn't do an assisted living center, which is something we looked at, essentially a medical facility. You just can't do it because you don't have the water supply. So that's why, again, this is a was a nice balancing 
uh, we thought for what the community was looking for low impact and what makes the property uh, economically viable. Um, with respect to Ms. Arison's comments, um, no, we're not a, um, a wetland uh, by definition or otherwise. In fact, uh, our landscape architect gave you much background on, on the type of uh, soil that we're on. Um, so it couldn't be further from that representation. Um, and then finally, in regards to uh, Mr. Feeney's comments, um, while I appreciate uh, the technical aspects of it, I think it's as I depicted to you on that diagram. And it just goes back to the simple reality. You have the concrete barrier of the foundation, then you have the number of levels I gave you there before it can migrate and get down to anything. And then you do, if there's such, such circumstance, have insurance. So you're talking about million dollars of cleanup is a lot of cleanup. There, there are no big foundation, there are no big structures here. These are small foundations for storage facilities, something very easily uh, dealt with, remedied around it, where you bring up the number one way, the easiest way to do is just get rid of the contaminant and you replace it with clean soil and you put it back in, if that were ever to happen. Again, we're going down a road here that's to, to reach the magnitude of anything that's been suggested, I would suggest you is, is really not practical and not practical. Thank you. Um, that being said, um, one, Mary Ellen, but quick, um, go ahead. I, I would just like to comment, uh, to compliment the applicants for being pleasant and congenial and coming so many <laughs> times to these hearings. Um, and I would like to encourage the board to um, vote their consciences, but also to remember that you've had over 100 people, different people coming every week to hear and to express their opinion. And I have not heard one that favors the project. And I would think that as representatives of the town, you should weigh that very heavily um, and vote in the best interest as the townspeople see it. Thank you. Um, that said, we're going to we're going to continue this because what we'd like to do is send your new plans. If you have your engineers, send a copy. Yep. Okay. To time bond and copy Joanne to planning. Uh, digital, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. PDF. Mm -hmm. They'll do their due diligence for the town. I'll speak to uh, Gene Christie um, and see if we can. <laughs> Yes, the, they're they're busy. I know they're busy. Okay. Um, so with that said, ready for the next. I think we got one. Oh yeah. We do have one on the first. So we'd like to propose to you the eighth of December. Okay. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> we got to get it done. <laughs> yeah, that's 615. It's a, it's a Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. Okay. 615. We should have everything back. And what time you said? 615. So we should have everything back. So the so the other requesting you're making uh, of us is to send the uh, plan of time bonds and then you review before that meeting. Correct. Okay. Yep. Just with your your um, calculations on the storm water. Yeah. yeah. If there's if they've changed, I don't know if they've changed with any of this. I I I, I mean, understand they haven't, but I'll confirm that. I I can't. But time you know. also has to review it to the new storm the water. current storm water. The, yeah, yes. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Going to tiny bar. I wasn't, I went and checked it out. I wasn't screwed up a little bit. They renewed it for section five, section 10. And like I thought, the general bylaw. So they didn't touch it for six. We we know. Okay, we we're we're oh, oh okay yeah. So I was kind of winging it. But... <laughs> no, we're up no, I, no, I was. I, I'll be honest. I was winging it. Come on, let me put you. I was right. 
For this one? Or for, for this one. Just for this one, John, I was right. It was done by review and it came for section five, section 10 of the general bylaw. Yeah. Yeah. So they're going to we have we've we've notified them on the previous <laughs> Um, Just a quick one. Yes. Bobby Grant, we were out. Um, was something mentioned about pest control? Yes. Mice, but, okay, what was the answer? Sorry. Yeah, if there's if there's an issue of that nature, we either do insecticide or have a uh, you know green or company like that come in. Okay, and then where is that residue going? Which residue? <laughs> yeah. Chemicals. There's, it's, the chemicals don't pet, permeate down. There's a million ways they do. They do it on sites all over the place, like aquifers, wetlands, everything. We, I mean, it's just a pest. It's yeah, just, it's, it's an organic pesticide. It doesn't go into the. It doesn't flow below that. We're not talking mm -hmm. volumes. Thick. Great for. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's that's it. Um, I'm going to close. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go with the continuance. For right now, I'm going to um, take a motion to. Thank you. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, I move that um, uh, that uh, you want this particular um, 2021 C. Thank you. 2021 C <laughs> be continued to uh, December 8th at 6 15 p.m. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seconded. All in favor? Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's a paper. Yeah. You got to sign. I know that you can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody.